something that's going to the community, hashtag EU Green Week. Okay? Now, I do speak fast. If I speak too fast, just holler. Okay? I'm very aware of the time we have and the ground we have to cover, but if it's too speedy, okay, just wave your hands. We're focusing this morning on waste prevention. It's the highest priority in the waste hierarchy, which is very much enshrined in EU waste law. And we're going to explore some key issues around generating less waste. Why is it so important? But critically, how can it be done? How can cities encourage diverse stakeholders to generate less waste? Citizens, businesses, institutions, everybody needs to do their bit. So what are the best ways to motivate people to do it and to give them the practical steps to be able to do that. If we look at the circular economy as a whole, we have to look at that and see what is the role of waste prevention and reuse, okay? Now, of course, all these discussions take place, I'm sure you know this, uh, against the backdrop of the marathon talks that took place between the Council and the Parliament at the end of last year around the proposed package of waste legislation when four EU directives were covered. And, of course, on Tuesday, I think, am I right? It was rubber-stamped by the Council. So that's the kind of context. Also, very importantly, this is an EU event, and that means sharing replicable examples. So that's the spirit. We are going to tackle the big picture issues, but really using some concrete case studies. That's critical. From government, from local authorities across the EU that can explain their waste prevention and management activities. And what's great as well is we're going to hear how the social enterprises fit into the mix. How can cities, how can local authorities, how can policies support reuse and repair? We're not just talking recycling, reuse and repair, all in the mission of waste prevention and the links between pub public procurement and social inclusion. And it's a very, very interesting issue, very interesting paradigm that we're also going to touch on today. And fantastically, we're going to find out about a tool that actually helps municipalities do their thing in preventing waste, okay? So very, very practical. Five eloquent speakers. Very rapidly, let me find out who you are. Do we have any representatives from the EU institutions in the house? Where are you? Okay, they are only sitting together. Do you see that? I, I quite like to do this. It's what I call a Freudian Venn diagram to see how people unwittingly seat themselves. Do we have researchers and academia? Come on, you should all put your hands up and say, I'm clever. I mean, everybody's an academic in the house. Local authorities? Local authorities? Well, we should have. Yeah, good. Business? Business? Uh, NGOs? Okay, anybody from the media? Okay, fantastic, thank you very much. Critically, your voice today is important, so don't be shy. There are two ways that you can get involved in our discussions, and then I promise I'm going to hand over to our first speaker. First, raised hand, if you are a Luddite like me and rather old-fashioned, very happy with a raised hand. If not, we have a wireless networking system, okay? You can go in there, you can see the program, you can see the participants, and you can ask questions or make comments and like other people's comments, all right? So, the event code is 2604. If you haven't logged in, can you, can you just take a moment to log in now, okay? And you need to select a location so you find the correct session. All right, so select a location. I hope you know you're in the right room. If not, you'll know now and you can go somewhere else. All right? All clear? You're set up? Introductory points over? Okay, last thing. Any intervention you have, nice and concise, please. I need to get you out of here by 11 o'clock. So, shall we meet the speakers? They've sat there showing their fine dental work for the last three minutes. I must introduce them. We have from Zero Waste Europe, Joan Marc Simon, who is Executive Director. And he's been a leading voice for this organization since 2007. So very good at increasing visibility and its impact on policy. He's not just a speaker, he's a practitioner. You advise on the implementation of zero waste strategies in different European cities. So um, he's the hands-on guy and he has a background in good governance and social justice and the environment and many other things. I keep it nice and short. You can give him a clap. I like to warm up the room and make people feel happy, so please applaud him. 
We also have Mikael Len, who is Director of Reuse. It's a representative association for social enterprises, active in the field of reuse, repair and recycling. You've been in the organisation, I think, am I right, since 2011? Do I have that on? Okay. And specialises in EU waste and product policies, and in particular, he's been focusing on the role of social enterprise in the circular economy. We also have Agnes Bauman. It's always great to have women on my panel. Agnes Bauman, who is the communications advisor for Rover Holding, which is a non-profit public waste collection company in the Netherlands. And their strategy is anchored very much in the mission slogan, from waste to resource. And the company is continuously developing methods to reduce residual waste. And she's here to talk about a fabulous project uh, that started in 2015 called 100, 100, 100, in which waste prevention is the central theme. You can have a clap of Agnes, please. <clears throat> Right in the middle, we have Sebastia Sanso Jaume, who is Director General at the Directorate General for Environmental Education, Environmental Quality and Waste in the Government of the Balearic Islands. I think you have the longest title today. Um, he has a degree in environmental sciences. He's worked in the Alternative Energy Centre of Wales as an environmental auditor. So he's done an awful lot of things and obviously very well qualified to be on our panel today. And it's very interesting. You're going to talk about something really quite bold. I think. I'm very, very interested to hear your presentation. And finally, on the end, last but by no means least, as the Brits say, we have Dr. Susanna Lopez. She's a technician in the International Business Unit of LIPOR, which is the Intermunicipal Service for Waste Management in Greater Porto in Portugal. And she ensures technically the promotion of cooperation with national and international entities. She's got quite a history there, coordinator in the new projects department and in production and logistics. So she's done a lot around prevention, around awareness, maintenance, bio-waste, composting, you'll see. All right? So... Are we all good? Yeah? I'm now going to hand over the microphone to Zero Waste Europe, uh, John Mark, and I'd like to hear about this tool that you've developed for municipalities, please. And as you know, you've got a lovely, lengthy eight minutes. A round of applause, please. Thank you. I have only eight minutes, so let's get started. Good morning, everyone. I'm very happy to be here. And, uh, and as Zero Waste Europe, we're very happy also to present the Zero Waste uh, master plan, which is the result of a work that uh, we have been implementing over the last years. And uh, why a master plan? We prepared a very short video for you to start the day. Um, can you click on the video or should I do it? As a city planner, politician or community leader, you're working hard on making your city more livable, more efficient, more vibrant. And when it comes to waste, things are not always glamorous, as you know. But we've got good news. The EU is now setting the stage for a circular economy, and a fast-growing number of cities are showing the way towards a zero-waste society. A society that no longer needs landfills or incinerators. People want smarter, healthier lifestyles. People want to get involved. People want their money to stay within their communities, and people want more local jobs. That's what zero waste is about. And guess what? It works. Based on a wide range of case studies, Zero Waste Europe has developed a set of roadmaps, strategies and tools to help you in your campaign, a real master plan that community leaders are now using all around Europe to drive change step by step. It's never been easier for you to get started. You'll find our startup toolkit on zerowasteeurope.eu. It's free, it's for everyone, and we're here to help. Right. Okay, so that's, that's the, the Zero Waste Cities Master Plan. So it's a structured approach to guide a city to zero waste. And what is important is, is it doesn't matter where you start. That what matters is really the direction you want to go. Because this is, you will find lots of uh, best practices and front runners in this network. But it is very important to understand that actually most of Europe is, is, is not there yet. And this is a plan actually to get you from wherever you are in the direction uh, to zero waste. So how can the master plan help you? So it is a tool to ensure that your city abides by the newest EU waste legislation. As it has been presented, the, the waste package has been recently approved and it's quite ambitious. It's going to require changes at the local level because that's where things actually happen. 
and, and we make sure that, uh, that all the measures go in the direction of actually implementing EU waste legislation. This is also a tool to help you leapfrog decades of experience. There's no need to reinvent the wheel. Um, in Europe, we know already how to do uh, things good and quickly. So we have examples on how actually how to jump from 20 to 60, 70, 80 percent separate collection and reduce waste generation by more than 40 percent in three or four years. There's no need for like 20 years anymore. And we're going to need this if we want to implement the EU legislation. And it's also a springboard towards sustainable circular economy. Because what we've seen with the, with the zero waste uh, cities is that by starting tackling waste, you actually you turn waste into a resource and then you have innovation springing, you have um, lots of um, companies wanting to do things with waste, trying to prevent waste in the first place, and that's how it starts. And then it gets some very interesting dynamics that create ecosystems that actually make the city thrive. So how does this look like? The Zero Waste Master Plan is, um, is a platform uh, to make the city zero waste. There's a startup toolkit that you can download from the website uh, that was presented in the video. There's going to be webinars as well, specialized on uh, different things of waste prevention, like uh, community composting, uh, reuse of uh, electronic equipment, uh, you name it. Uh, there's going to be also in-person workshops and trainings when you get to actually go deeper into like the implementation. There's case studies, so we have a, a network of uh, municipalities and we have pro uh, produced case studies so that you can learn how other cities have done it. There's study tours as well for like uh, policy makers, for uh, city officials to visit best practices in other places and build the, these relationships. And also there's a pool of experts ready to help and to be deployed if you want to like uh, draft the, the, the waste management plan or implement it. And all of that is going to be, uh, it's, it's already online and it's going to be launched in the month of September. What are the benefits for your city? Um, with the zero waste uh, plan, you're going to have less litter because it's going to be, we're going to be preventing waste. There's going to be less waste to manage because it's going to be separately collected and turned into resource. There's going to be less residuals. That means that the city in itself, and that's something we've seen over and over in our practices, this is not theory, this is actually our experience, the, exp the, the expenses of the city go down. That means less fees for the citizens and, of course, less environmental impact. All of that results to more social integration. You create local jobs, uh, the social innovation as well, so like the money stays in the community. And, of course, uh, you also comply with EU law, which is, of course, not a bad thing. A couple of examples. Um, this is from the site of the economics, the case of the city of Parma, which is uh, more than 200,000 people uh, city. Um, from 2013 to 2014, you see how in only one year when we actually implemented the, the prevention and the waste uh, collection system, you, it's difficult to see here, but basically what happens is that if the cost of collection go up, the cost of treatment, the cost of sending waste to landfill and incineration go down, which happens that results in only one year a saving of uh, half a million euros for the city. Um, if we would look at the results now, the savings are even bigger, which is, this is money that can be invested into other things. And for less money, you have created more jobs as well, and you are managing less waste. Another example from France, the, the city of Besançon as well, 220,000 inhabitants. That's a case of uh, waste prevention, where 70% uh, of the population does home composting or community composting. The savings in treatment alone, I'm not talking about the waste that doesn't need to be collected because this organic waste is managed on source, is almost 800,000 euros uh, per year. And the fees for the citizens are 72 uh, euros when the French average is 102. These are just two examples. I could give you a lot more of other cities that like replicate this system. So doing the things right costs less money, saves money to the citizens, mm -hmm. creates local jobs. So I think it's a compelling uh, case to actually join the Zero Waste Master Plan. The impacts we're having so far, so since the start of the program, 400 municipalities have engaged to develop the Zero Waste strategies, and some of them are leading examples, so that front runners in Europe are part of this uh, network, uh, such like the case in Contarina in Italy, or the first uh, European Zero Waste capital that was Ljubljana. 
And also we have built a network of local and national contact points with the Zero Waste Europe members, which is our uh, local civil society groups working with the municipalities and also with uh, businesses. So I think, uh, to conclude, what matters here is to create this ecosystem, like in nature, where actually like different parts of the ecosystem thrive and the triangle between policy making and uh, civil society and, and, and businesses actually uh, cooperate. So if you're interested in this, I would advise you to sign up for the newsletter. Lots of things are going to be uh, done in the next months. Download the master plan startup toolkit, which again, it's a, it's a modular toolkit where we're going to be continuing, uh, continuously adding new stuff as we produce it. And we can also, if you are really, really interested, you can book or request a study tour, workshop, training, and we'll be happy to assist you. Thank you, Thank you very much. Thank you very much. I love it. How could anyone not download anything called a master plan? I mean, that's just great. So I, I pick out, just before I turn to you, a couple of things. I think it's interesting to hear you say in Europe, we know how to do things good and we know how to do them quickly, because it's not actually often I hear that when we're talking about, about what's happening. So I, I feel enthused about that. One very quick question. Um, you said doing things right costs less money. Um, what is, do you think, the reason most municipalities, you cited 400 there engage? Is it the reduced expenses, or is it the environmental side, or is it the linking of the environment and social inclusion? Do you have any metrics or anecdotal evidence on that? Or is it always money that makes people do the right thing? No. Actually, um, there's many motivations, because it's interesting that actually these transitions mostly happen because of the initiative from civil society. Okay. There's an environmental problem or there's a yeah, uh, real pollution problem. Um, they go to the policymakers and then uh, together they agree to implement a zero waste plan. And of course, the economics help. I mean, it's so like, um, yes, it's, it costs money, um, but I think the benefits really outweigh the, the, the costs. Okay. So it's not only the economics, but it's an important factor. Because if you want to convince policymakers, I mean, uh, it's, about the it's yeah. But, but also there's the environment and also the job creation. That's yeah. something that it, I think is, is very important, how you actually create this ecosystem and you see actually jobs not only in the public sector or in the waste collection yeah. services, actually. Uh, the, the most jobs are created in what is really the circular economy, the yeah. reuse, yeah. the design, etc. because mm -hmm. you need to engineer a completely mm -hmm. different society that is wired for, yeah. to be circular and not to be linear anymore. Yeah. And that's where the job creation really is. Okay, thank you very much. And you have very nicely sort of provided an entry for our next speaker because this is what we were chatting about, the, the job creation side with the reuse and also how we get people to change mentalities. So could you please give a very warm welcome to our speaker from reuse. Welcome to you, Mikhail. Thank you, Katrina. Brilliant. So I'd like to take the next few minutes just to give a general presentation really about what cities and municipalities can do to support reuse and also the role of social enterprise within that space. So most of our members are active in the second-hand industry <clears throat> and as you probably understand that very much the idea of prolonging set the lives of product is uh, very good for the environment, um, but they also provide low-cost goods for people on a low budget and people really uh, who are struggling to buy uh, new. Now, the way social enterprises differ from traditional organizations working in the second-hand industry is that they use the economic activity of reuse and repair to provide job and training opportunities for people who are disadvantaged in some way. So they very much work on, on, on the the inc inclusion activities of persons who are very much marginalized in the community. So, I mean, in conclusion, social enterprises provide a very important environmental and social service to the local communities and municipalities, and it's crucial that municipalities recognize, recognize these in order to be able to create partnerships. And in general, municipalities tend to be the natural partner of social enterprises um, working in the field of, uh, of reuse and waste management. So in general, what can cities do? I wanted to, to give a few general tools that cities are using at the moment to support social enterprise. One is public procurement. As I mentioned, recognition of social value is crucial. You don't often, let's say, 
being able to demonstrate what the impact is on your communities through being able to you know, provide a job to someone who's been out of work for a very long time and to get them back onto the open labour market is something which a lot of social enterprises do a lot of the time and try and work with the communities to understand this. And there are some cities which have even reserved contracts, for example, in waste management just to social enterprises. So, for example, the city of Vicenza in Italy has reserved tenders for waste collection of below 200,000 euros just to social enterprises working in that field because they recognise that they wish to not only have a service in terms of waste collection but also also support the local community in terms of job creation. Our member in Spain, uh, IRS, is now working on a social impact calculator that will be able to demonstrate to municipalities and also to citizens the importance not only of being able to reuse in terms of environmental benefits, but also in terms of job creation and the social return on investment by partnering with a social enterprise. Um, in terms of green procurement, we have many local authorities which have started to, for example, procure second-hand. For example, if local authorities are managing social housing, instead of furnishing the social housing with new goods, they are supporting local uh, reuse organisations by purchasing second-hand from them in order to furnish the social housing. So working with local authorities to understand this idea of implementing most economically advantageous tenders or meat is something very important for us um, and something which we intend to, to work on further in the future. Concerning waste prevention programs and policies, something is, ve is very important. Reuse targets we have been promoting as an organization for a very long time. The idea of having mandatory reuse targets is to inspire new partnerships between social enterprises, local authorities, uh, private companies, etc., to try and boost uh, reuse activities and the employment associated with it. Um, we have a long-running target in Flanders, for example, concerning reuse. And the interesting thing is that this target has been created as a marriage between environmental and resource policy in Flanders, as well as employment policy. So the reuse target is directly linked to the creation of uh, social employment. And I think this is very important when looking at reuse targets going forward. Making it easy for citizens to be able to uh, donate uh, the things which they don't need anymore and making systems of collection efficient and oriented towards reuse is, is really something that municipalities can help with and collaborate with social enterprises to make. In France, for example, the city of Paris is working with a, a very large uh, French network called Emmaus, maybe some of you uh, know it, in order to create a new system of collection points that makes it very easy for citizens to donate their unwanted goods and this is really something making it convenient is extremely important convenience to donate there are many more examples but it's interesting maybe later for the debate to talk about the new waste framework directive and the new conversations that could be happening at local level in order to really encourage reuse activities going forward Concerning economic policies to encourage reuse and repair, um, we know that repair is becoming increasingly marginalised. It's more convenient to buy a cheaper product rather than to try and repair one which is broken down. Some cities have taken it into their hands to try and reward citizens financially for getting something repaired. So the city of Graz, for example, is giving 100 euros maximum to every household uh, to reimburse certain types of repair costs that they have throughout the year. So last year, 90 households were given, were, were, were awarded uh, this, this grant, and this year we've already had 160 uh, requests in the city of Graz. So it's interesting making those financial incentives to encourage households uh, to repair. Some municipalities, when it comes to supporting social enterprises, have also you know, provided um, space and, uh, for example, shop space or warehouses to social enterprise also because they, they realise that <clears throat> in order for them to grow, they can need some help at the very beginning in order to start working on their activities. We can talk about VAT maybe later, but this is a, a national competence, so rather kind of out of the hands in general for cities. And lastly, a quick word on communication campaigns. It's something which is very important. Now, attitudes to reuse and repair vary greatly from city to city, region to region, and across Europe. You know, attitudes to buying second hand vary greatly. I think municipalities and cities need to understand these, these uh, <clears throat> differences in behavior when setting their strategies for waste prevention. I think one re really interesting recent collaboration between uh, social enterprises and municipalities is the outsourcing of training and workshops on behalf of the municipality to social enterprises. So social enterprises in 
again, uh, for example, in Helsinki, are going out to communities and school groups and teaching children about sustainable lifestyles on behalf of the municipalities, because the municipalities think, what well, if these organizations are working really practically in the field, in the field of reuse and repair, they're the best organizations to deliver these types of messages. So I think that's really this idea of training and working in the community and providing other services other than just you know your classic reuse and repair something which is really important and a really good example of collaboration between municipalities and social enterprise so in conclusion reuse is not just an activity to be used for environmental good social the social value must be clearly recognized and i think um, municipalities can do a lot in order to be able to really support these types of activities thank you Thank you. Thank you for your clarity, and you got a lot in there in a short time. I do want to, um, just a quick question to pick up. It's interesting because your um, presentation echoes the, the word that you used, which is the creation of an ecosystem. And I said, is it just the money? And you said, well, actually, no. Money is important, but it really isn't just the money. And you echo what you gave an example there, I believe, was in Flanders. You said it's these policy areas, environment, employment, resource. It doesn't take me to tell you that you know that there is a tendency to work in silos. That's, and we, we know this. So just very quickly in a nutshell, what is it in the DNA of the Flemish? What is it there that makes that work, that gets everybody under the same umbrella? I think uh, the, the Flemish story is, is, is quite specific, but in general, it's, it's really this understanding of a few municipalities who are in tune very much with uh, local, local actors working in the field of reuse and repair, that they realize that supporting reuse can directly have, a, have an impact on their, on their local communities. And this recognition simply of the benefits of supporting the reintegration of disadvantaged groups carries a lot of value, which maybe is difficult to quantify in general. It's, quite, it's easy to quantify environmental benefits through tonnage, et cetera. But what is really the value to society, for example, of you know, stopping a young offender from reoffending, having been through an integration contract? Mm -hmm. you know, these are the things which is difficult to quantify, stories which can be quite powerful and need to be got across more. And at the beginning, when the social enterprises in, in Flanders were starting, also it was a model taken from the Netherlands, um, it was really very much about communicating these benefits okay. to local authorities to generate these partnerships and then to create the targets which have now been working for, for, for in place for quite some time now. Okay, thank you very much. And I think um, it's interesting, again, it's a kind of a nice segue into our next speaker, which is going to be Agnes, because um, we do want to look at the whole um, motivation for people and we want to look at citizens' behaviour and how that ties into reinforcing what the municipalities are doing. You talked about outreach in schools. So I think, Agnes, I hope, I think you're going to give us a very, very nice example of your project, the 100, 100, 100 project, which mm -hmm. really was an interesting exploration of how people can make the choices to get engaged in waste prevention themselves. So yes. let's hear from you. Thank, Thank you very you. much. Our main question is, what do you have to do to prevent residual waste? I work for uh, ROVA, it's a public waste collection company, and our stakeholders are 23 municipalities in the middle and east of the Netherlands. From waste to resource and a waste-free society are our keywords. We introduced in 2011 the system of reverse collection. That means resources are collected on the curbside and residual waste has to be taken to drop off facilities in the neighborhood. This system leads to good results. Our recycling rates are up to 80 to 90 percent. But a waste-free society requires more. So, in 2014, we considered what can we do more and what can our inhabitants do more for the next step towards a waste-free society. Because ROVA is a waste collection company and household waste collection is, takes place at the end of the product's life circle, circle. And possibilities for products and material reuse have to do with choices made by consumers and producers. 
In other words, a waste-free society is not about waste. It's all about people and their behavior. With this in mind, Rova launched a social experiment centering on waste prevention. And I can already tell you, it works. To gain insight into the possibilities and impossibilities of living waste-free, we challenged 100 households to live a 100% recycle uh, life as regards to waste and raw materials. And that for 100 days. So the experiment in Dutch was called 100, 100, 100. When we announced the experiment, it was immediately a success. In two days, over 400 people signed in, and we also invited aldermen and local politicians. National TV news uh, paid attention to the project, and on that point, we didn't even start. R Rova collaborated with the University of Groningen, and with the Utrecht University. And Groningen contributed to the product's behavioral dim dimension, and Utrecht determined the environmental impact. The main call is showing the possibilities and impossibilities of the road towards a waste-free society. The main call is to raise awareness directly among the participating households and indirectly through our own communication and interest generated in the experiment. Another aim was to provide, provide information about opportunities and obstacles on the road to a road-free society in terms of willingness and scope for further behavioral change, insight into remaining household waste products and opportunities for producers and na nationwide political debate. The 100-day challenge started on the 1st of January 2015. We wanted to stimulate the participants to improve waste sorting, separation. We wanted them to change their consumption behavior, because buying products, uh, so they can buy products that can be recycled after disposal, and try to prevent waste, because we all know the best method of waste prevention is to buy less. We made three groups. 50 households were intensively monitored and given a concrete line of action to their specific situation. For example, they received a special bin, a visit by a coach, and tips about the best way to arrange their refrigerator contents to prevent food waste. The remaining households in the experiment received more generally online coaching. And to measure the impact, we also tracked a control group that did not take part in the experiment. The participating households were motivated and motivated each other at the web, plap at the web plap platform. Each week, households were challenged to take part in a specific assignment on the waste-related theme. For example, count how many packages you open on one day or take a picture of the waste in your kitchen, kitchen sink after uh, preparing an evening meal. These assignments helped to raise participants' awareness of their behavior. Households could also fill in a special waste meter on the platform to keep track of their own results and compare them with those of the other households. And then the results after 100 days. By the end of the experiment, participating households achieved a residual waste result equal to 22.5 kilograms per person per year. This is 98% less residual waste than the Dutch average in 2015. We saw that 85% uh, of the waste was well sorted. The 15% remaining, was not so, which was not sorted well, were mainly kitchen waste uh, uh, food, uh, food remains. And here you see a list of the products that cannot be recycled in, in the Netherlands. So that was the residual waste people uh, kept. 
The waste produced by the participating households was collected and analyzed before the experiment and at the end to determine the environmental impact. Utrecht University concluded that the increased share of sorted waste and the reduction of residual waste resulted in a smaller impact. The University of Groningen concluded that waste separation increased among both participants and the control group because all people seemed to find waste separation easier than they expected before. When it came to waste reduction, in the form of prevention, only the participants of the experiment made progress. The weekly assignments and the tips on the website contributed to this result. Oh. At, the, at the Congress, after the experiments, we handed over the results to the Secretary of State and invited other municipalities and companies to follow. I will search for the sheet. <laughs> and now, three years later, 180 municipalities in the Netherlands have carried out the, pro the project. We also handed over the results to the producers. Some of them renewed their packaging and for us, it's very important to make our own next step. We now ask attention for packaging-free shopping and are developing ways to give back feedback to inhabitants about their amount of waste and the raw materials. So our recommendations, you already noticed that we are exciting uh, about our experiments because reduction is possible. Residual waste reduction can be achieved through more and better waste separation and the participating household shows that reduction can also be, be achieved by focusing on prevention. You, all, you have to choose a clear message. Work from the household perspective. They, they are the key to success. That people experience the ease of waste separation for themselves, because it's easier than expected. And communicate not only on waste separation, but also on prevention and reduction. Long term intervention is essential. Give positive feedback and emphasize the contribution, their contribution to sustainability. And practice what you preach, of course. Ask colleagues to participate, local politicians. And of course, ensure that your own office and events are zero waste proof. What is very important to us and to our inhabitants is make it fun, make it a challenge. Don't, don't say what they don't uh, have to do, but say, but let's motivate it, the, the people, uh, each other and themselves and make it a pool uh, strategy. So at the end, what are you going to do now? for no zero residual waste. Thank you. Thank you. Let me just, just um, ask you a little, a little question as a follow-up. You said it at the end, you said you make it fun. Yeah. Uh, the other issue, which was obviously, you know, as useful as you could compare with others, always great to get people yeah. competitively. Yeah. So, I mean, if we just look at it, that's 100 days is three months. I mean, it's almost three. It's, it's longer than one thinks when one puts it mm -hmm. like that. A quick question, because we were chatting before to say, um, how do you get these nudges? What happened afterwards with these people. They took part. And then you said you had some conversations where you find some people will say, well, you know, I've got a limit there. I'm not going to change that coffee brand. But if you ask me about the cat litter, yeah, sure, I'll do. Can you tell me if there was any follow-up after the 100 days or if you got just very briefly a couple of insights into how they might be able to change that behavior on the longer term? Mm -hmm. We noticed that um, the the choices people can make themselves, um, they stay with their choices. We, we talked about uh, a coffee brand. One participant uh, told us, well, I'm not going to uh, choose for another coffee brand eh, because of the pa packaging, but uh, to take another uh, cat litter, it's okay with me. 
and they, we let them make their choices uh, themselves. Mm -hmm. And therefore, we now, we, we still are in contact with these participants, and uh, we know that they still have that behavior. Okay. And I think it's because they're, we, they were able to make that choices. Mm -hmm. It's that very interesting, isn't it? It's the carrot, the stick, the legislation, the incentive, the fun, the who's doing what, what's my peer group doing. Really, really interesting. Thank you. And very interesting, obviously, the explanation of the extent of municipalities that it, that, that, that it reached afterwards that were interested, mm -hmm. but also the information you gave to the producer, critical, because yeah. that's also what we haven't had in this discussion yeah. yet. We have to do it together. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Thank you for that. I'm now going to turn to uh, Sebastia Sanso, so you will need, um, you might need headsets. This is a very interesting, as I said, some bold steps. We're focusing on a different area, I think less the households at the moment and more the dealing with the negative effects of tourism and plastics in particular. So bear with me while I get my uh, headset and then otherwise it'd be a shame if I can't hear you. And then we can go. Okay. Thank you. Uh, gracias. Estoy esperando a ver. Okay. Okay, just to check everyone can hear. Good morning, everyone. I'm glad to participate in this session. Let me start by explaining something to you. You know that the main economic driver in the Balearic Islands is tourism. So many, many visitors and that leads to greater waste. So here we have the graphs that show the impact of tourists on the island. And what about the sorting of rubbish? We're not doing that well. But we do have some good examples to lead the way. Here we have one town, Esporles, which has introduced a new payment system which has led to a radical reduction in waste uh, production, so uh, a 70% increase in, in sorting of waste. Here we have another uh, city where we have a lot of hotels, hotel beds and here there's now a new container system which weighs the containers which checks uh, how much waste has been separated how much uh, waste has been reduced by and then you get a bonus according to that so we've gone from 10,000 uh, tons of waste produced there to around 7,000 tons What's key to change is Palma, because Palma is the capital of the Balearic Islands, where we have half of all of the inhabitants of Mallorca. In Palma, we're also on the right path, because over a very short amount of time, we've had more uh, sorting of waste, we've managed to reduce waste, and in the city centre, there are mobile waste uh, collection trucks, so they're electric vehicles. So over th uh, just three months those electric uh, collection trucks have managed to uh, reduce waste. We also have uh, other measures and we've realized that key is payment per generation. So we want these kind of practices uh, to be obligatory for all municipalities in the Balearic Islands. So we have many, many municipalities applying this kind of system, more than in much of the rest of Spain. What is also important to effect change is to reduce organic waste and collect organic waste. That also includes the selective collection of textiles and vegetable oil. One of our main goals, we have many of them, but when we look at our cities and municipalities and waste management, we obviously want to reduce waste. So the first way to reduce waste is not to produce the waste at all. And one of the main issues there is food waste and food losses. 
in addition. Because of their environmental impact, we're trying to clamp down on the distribution of certain single-use plastics, so that includes um, single-use plastic bags. So we're instead offering bags that are biodegradable, that can be uh, composted, so light and very light bags, uh, also trying to use less plastic glasses, plates, cutlery and trays. We also have uh, campaigns on beaches to pick up waste and what you see on the beach are lots of uh, Q-tips or earbuds that people use to clean their ears. We're also uh, insisting that lighters, razors, cartridges and uh, toners in printers have to be reusable and we're also trying to ensure that products don't contain pro cosmetic products don't contain microplastics or nanoplastics we're also trying to introduce new recyclable or compostable coffee capsules so either the coffee capsules has to have to be recyclable or has to be possible to collect them to reuse them Another measure is taking place in restaurants. If you're eating the food on the premises, then it's uh, no longer possible to use single-use utensils. So it depends on the restaurant or the hotel of course but many many restaurants were producing a lot of waste that was completely avoidable then there's another problem which are wipes uh, so manufacturers now have to indicate on the packaging you can't throw these wipes down the toilet because, and because they're not uh, biodegradable they're not they don't break down and there's a study that shows every year each Spaniard pays five euros for the cleanup of the toilet pipes, of the sewage systems, because there are blockages and it costs money to uh, get rid of these wipes. As the administrative authorities, we have to lead the way. So we're promoting the availability of water sources, water fountains so we want it to be possible to go to a restaurant and you should be able to ask for a glass of free water and if you look at the right you see the kind of waste that is produced after a party or a, a fair or a festival and we want to uh, avoid that kind of single-use plastic after an event so we want there to be a deposit on the bottles uh, so that you take the bottle back there are two other reasons we're acting uh, we've heard about this at a worldwide level internationally you'll have heard that there are studies that show that the commerce, commercial fish we're eating contains microplastic and then we have a seabird uh, the Balearic shearwater and the main cause of mortality of that bird is because it's eaten plastic so here uh, we have a summary of th the new uh, bill, the new draft bill that we're putting forward. So we have, uh, we, here we have a new uh, hotel chain which intends to get rid of all single-use items in its rooms. So that was it, that was a quick overview and of course uh, I'm available if you have any questions.
Thank you. And I know it's never fair because there's so much to say. And I think what is very interesting about, about your case is this absolutely holistic approach. But a question, because here we were, look, we were talking about household behaviour. We were talking about local communities. And there is a certain, you know, I'm invested in my local community. Here you are also talking about visitor behaviour. So you have a different chat. Well, I'm not staying here. I'm just coming for a bit and then I'm off. So... You can um, help engage visitors by making sure that the hotels that greet them are doing the right thing. But is it, is it a tricky one, do you find, with the, with, the, with the tourist mentality? You talked about people partying and dumping their stuff. Is that particularly challenging? A ver si he entendido bien la pregunta. Uh, Hopefully I've understood your question. Well, tourists are generally civilized people. Normally they're from quite uh, advanced countries when it comes to environmental issues. So this makes things easier. But you have to make get people involved in good practices. I went over it quite quickly because I didn't have much time. But as a government, we also have a tourism tax. So we have this tourism tax to kind of offset or compensate the environmental impact caused by tourists and tourism. So that's, as I've said, tourism is our main economic driver on the island. But it does lead to an impact. So as a government, we came up with this tax to offset the impact. And this tax is then used to fund projects which will help us to change our model, our waste model. So a specific part of that funds is there to promote uh, social entities which are involved in the circle, circular economy. Part of the money is used to organize workshops to cut down on waste. And then day to day, um, when hotels buy appliances, uh, they can also use those funds. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Okay, well, you, I'm glad I gave you the chance to finish from your seat. So, interesting. Okay, I'm sure there will be questions for you. So, what I'm going to do is we're going to hear the last presentation, and then I'm going to uh, directly open things to the floor so we have a good 25 minutes for your intervention. So, this is interesting because we touched again here on food waste. Um, and I think you're going to talk a little bit in more depth about that. We talked about that being one of the primary key areas to get people's awareness raised about waste prevention. So thank you, Susanna. Uh, please round up these opening presentations. Okay, I'm small. <laughs> uh, hello, good morning. And I'm very happy to be here. And uh, uh, for us, it's very, very important uh, as a small country as Portugal to, to be here uh, to share our experience and uh, also important to learn with all of us. So um, to start, prevention. We, everyone knows about prevention and if we make a survey, the first answer it will be yes, I comply the waste hierarchy, so I do prevention. Mm, okay, we will see. So about Plastic waste and food waste, for us, there are the two major economical, social, and environment problems. Or not problems, challenge. Uh, that are facing Europe and obviously also Portugal. So we have a challenge. Why we choose food waste? Because first, one third of uh, world's food producer for human consumption is waste. But at the same time, 26% of people are starving. And here in Europe, 5% of EU, EU population are at risk of undernutrition. And we are all developed countries. In Portugal, more than 22% of our municipal waste is food. And we produce per year more than 4 million tons. So 
a huge amount of nutrients we are wasted per year. So we need to act. Very quickly, who we are. So LIPOR is a, an organization, a public organization, responsible for the management, assessment, and treatment of municipal waste produced by eight municipalities located at the north of Portugal. So we are greater Porto area. A LIPOR is committed uh, to the goal of continuous improve the selective collection, but more important, to prevent the waste. Because before treat, is important to prevent the waste. So what can we do? We can do a lot. And as I, I said before, we start for food waste because it's important to prevent the nutrients. And it's important also to say that in Portugal, uh, we have more than 60% of our land is affected by soil degradation. So it's very, very important to prevent the food waste and to capture the value of uh, the organic matter. So what we can do? Reduce production of food waste. Now we are working with our Portuguese Association of Nutritionists because it's important to promote a well-balanced diet. And we are working with uh, school canteens because we need to improve the consumption of fruits and vegetables, reduce the amount of meat and fish that we eat, and it's important to start at schools. And very important also, raise population awareness for need of a change in behaviors, because prevention is most a behavior. So we need to act and change our behaviors. It's not just speak about waste, it's about our behavior, our behavior as a consumer. So at the same time, we need to promote best practice practice regarding sustainable cons consumption. And for that, we need to work with all the stakeholders. That means since the design, the production, the distribution, do not forget the distribution, the shopping malls, the markets, and also then we need to work with the treatment plants. That what we are, sleep, sleep or treat waste, but we want to prevent the waste. So two anchor projects that we have in place. We have one re uh, related with uh, preparation and cooked meals that we call dos certa, that means right portion size to eat for the plate, and the other is related with waste and we call embrulha, wrap it, that means for leftovers, what we can do with our leftovers. So about right portion project, we are working with uh, school canteens and restaurants, and also with shopping malls, so the, um, where people can eat. Four main actions, rising awareness, changing eating habits, so promote uh, seasonal products, local products, more vegetables, more fruits, less meat, sustainable consumption, and like this, we can reduce and combat food waste, and at the same time, promote healthier meals. How we eat, how we, we, we do, five steps. So first, a commitment with the uh, canteen or the restaurant involved. Very important to have a first commitment. Then we do an assessment. That means we need to measure the develop of, the, of this initiative. So what is the amount of waste, uh, food waste they produce? If we prepare in a different way, uh, in a better way, our meals, what will be the amount of food waste we'll have at the end? So we need to weight the beans and during a certain period to show to the uh, employees and the owners what they can prevent and also not only in terms of the waste but in terms of the uh, uh, amount uh, of uh, money. Because when we, we uh, have waste, we also throw away money and organic matter is a value, a very, very important value that we need to prevent. After, very important, we do training courses. So inside the kitchen for the owners, for the employees, how to, how to buy first, how to buy the things, how to prepare the food, how to store the food, also everything to prevent at the end the food waste. 
And at the end, if they comply all these goals, we give a certification because it's important to give a, a positive feedback. As Agnes said, it's important to pass a positive information at the end. So we have a certification that, that can use and put and is a uh, terms of marketing also for the uh, customers that use that kind of canteens or restaurants. And do not forget, it's important to follow up this kind of project. People are aware of prevention, are aware of food waste, but if we are not all the time say you need to start to prevent, you need to change your behavior, mm -hmm. it's difficult to maintain this kind of project. So very, very important follow-up and monitoring. So the other project, the Anchor project, very quickly. Okay. So uh, before I pass to Embrulha to wrap it, just uh, to see the amount of waste that we can prevent. More than 30% just prepare in a different way our meals, the right portion. So we don't need to eat more, we need to eat the correct uh, way. That means right nutrients, right portions. So the other, embrulha. It's a doggy bag scheme, very easier that we implement in uh, Porto. So we start with Porto. Why? Because Porto is a very, now is a very touristic uh, zone, more than 4 million uh, tourists per year. So lots of restaurants appear, small restaurants, medium and bigger, and it's important to uh, work with these restaurants. So we start in 2016 with 15 restaurants, just to involve the employers and the owners is important, so all the uh, the people that work in the restaurants and the, the responsible for the restaurants. Past information for the customers, what we are doing and why, and we offer free packaging for uh, leftovers. And here it's important, we are now giving a card box, uh, cardboard box. Why? Because we want to be, to, be, to have a, in a place a sustainable project. So in the beginning we think about plastic box, uh, aluminium box and card. But we, we think plastic maybe goes to a landfill, aluminium is too expensive to, to capture the, the aluminium, so the best is to give a card box. And like that we can also have a biodegradable uh, material to uh, pick up our uh, leftovers. So very interesting, so the same uh, goals and promote the consumption of leftovers that are very, very important. So, some results. 85% of the restaurants, the owners of the restaurants, are, uh, agree with this kind of project, so it was not a problem. It, mm -hmm. They are very, very satisfied. And 90% of the clients agree with this project. And what we see, it's the people ask for uh, the, the box. Mm -hmm. They want to have the leftovers to eat uh, after, so, or to give to some, someone. So, it's a it was a very, very briefly um, um, view of what we are doing, but it, it is important that we can do more. And um, many, uh, what we are now doing also within our events, conference, where we serve meals, we also do this kind of we, we, all, we stay with all leftovers and at the end we work with social institutions or poor families and we redistribute the food, uh, the, the, this food because it's good food so it's important and at the same time we re reduce the, food, the waste that we need to treat in our case in our composting plant but it's important to pass the information that at the end of 2023 we need to collect the food waste. So before to collect, we must think and prevent this food waste. So to start and what we can do, just to finish, rethink our behavior, refuse when we are buying something, and do not forget, wasted food waste is waste uh, a very important value. And more than 26% needs our food. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, and interesting because I was in the States in the beginning of April and of course d'office there, you are being, you're being asked, take them. And even as a tourist, on, even on holiday, 
actually, incredibly, I did eat the leftover food I took away rather than going. So it's just, it's, it's, it's very interesting. It's very simple. And there, it's just a given. Here, would you like, do you want, do you want to bag it up? Yes, please. Um, and interesting also that you align, we were talking about the alignment of different priorities, societal priorities at the moment, social inclusion with the environment, employment. Here, we're looking at diet and health alongside with the portion size. And that's another big issue, certainly in the UK to tackle, certainly in Europe. So it's very interesting how there is this paradigm shift, fitting everything together. So let me open uh, to questions from the floor. All I will say is there's a couple of areas I'd like to revisit, but I want to give these people a chance to ask. You wanted to talk a bit about the directive and the impetus. You said that we... But we'll come back to that. I certainly want to look at the, um, the difficulties that the other waste treatment infrastructure might pose. You know, you've got MBT, you've got incineration. So where does that create difficulties at government and local authority level? And I hope to have time to come back to you about the home composting. But before all that, um, have people been asking questions in Connex Me? Do we have, um, can we see if there's anything coming up? I'm happy to do a poll, but I don't want to muck the um, Connex. No, we've got no questions. Was that no? Qu I'm not very good at reading the Indian smoke signals. No, okay. So can I go ahead and ask my questions? Yay! Okay, well, let's just come back. Um, let's just come back to you, I think, Emika. Let's talk because you wanted to sort of say something about the impact going forwards with all these conversations um, on the package and on waste, and, and to give that extra push. So I think you wanted to say a few words on that. Am I correct? I can do. Yep. <laughs> okay. I. Yep. Go. No, I'd be happy to. Um, but it's just really to say that um, you know, on on the back of the, uh, the vote in the council on the 22nd of May, it seems that over the next couple of years when the new revised uh, waste directives will be, will be transposed and starting to be implemented, there'll be, I would say, a mandatory conversation that has to happen at national level with municipalities, with cities, about finally how to tackle reuse, about what to do about it. The Commission are now looking into actual measurement indicators about how to measure reuse with possible targets in the future. We're going to be working very hard on that for the next uh, six to eight months in trying to, 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 to come to something. Um, there is now more clarity in, in the uh, Waste Framework Directive with this idea of uh, preparing for reuse rates being reported mm -hmm. separately from recycling. As, as a mandatory step, and I think this is very important. Um, and the idea that producer responsibility, when implementing extended producer responsibility, that there needs to be more financial support and information given to the consumer about what are the reuse and repair options mm -hmm. for the waste that they have, not just where to send the things for recycling. And I think that's very important. So to, mm -hmm. to really provide more information to the consumer about what to do their things when they, when they don't need them anymore. I think this is very important. And from our perspective as, as social enterprises, it's just, it's very good to see that the idea of support for social enterprise active in the reuse sector is explicitly recognized within the directive itself now. And so this mm -hmm. idea again of supporting social inclusion and reuse activities is at least given some form of a foothold in the new directive. So it's, it's a move forward. And I think you know, member states will just really have to look at the reuse question now a lot more closely beyond recycling. So I think it's important. But I think as we discussed before and where, you're, where you did um, you know, uh, reiterate with me is, is we talk about um, measurement indicators. It's not an easy one, is it? And uh, you were saying, you know, what do you do about the eBays? What do you do? You know, how do we see all that? And also the interesting thing in... in um, our perceptions, you know, there's lots of ladies who think, you know, vintage, vintage dresses, that's, a that's fine, but there are other things that are second-hand that are not. So there's that whole conversation that has to happen there. Did you want to add anything about, you know, or in, this same, uh, in the same vein? Is there going to be a push? Are we having the right conversations? Is it going at the speed you would like? Is it going in the direction that you would like? 
Well, from a legislative perspective, it's clear that what we have so far, it's all about managing waste, and it's not that much about how do we prevent this waste, how do we reuse, and actually I think that for me, if you want, that's, that's the next step. Um, we have seen in the presentations how actually there is evidence that it's possible to do, like uh, reduce residual waste, etc. cetera. Um, so I think the next steps really like develop these methodologies on actually how are we going to measure this, how are we going to make it happen, and I think we need to start thinking about setting some targets for residual waste mm -hmm. because we have many countries in Europe already like setting targets, etc. What we have so far in the legislation are mainly targets to recycle, to collect, which is all very good. I mean, it's all about uh, waste management, but uh, the waste prevention that is the extra mile is really what the circular economy is after all all about. It will require uh, really thinking together how are we going to measure this, how are we going to create the, create the right incentives, uh, but for sure we're going to need targets. And I think that's yeah, looking forward to the discussion in the, in the coming years. Just to come and, and to say, you know, it's, it's to look that there are these complex issues that we have, um, but the conversations are happening and they are critical. Um, when we talk about complexity, just to come now to that question that I asked about, you know, existing waste treatment infrastructure, where does that create difficulties? Where does that, how do you have those kinds of conversations? If you've got lock-ins to certain particular infrastructures, how do you work around that? Can you say something about this, please, Sebastian? Just a moment while I yes. set myself up. I'm a bit slow. Hang on a minute. Okay. See, sí. mm. Cuando hablamos de... Okay, when we talk about waste management and infrastructure on our islands, we're quite limited by our size. Sometimes we can't sustain and we can't deal with uh, the waste that is produced. We are in a special situation because we're an autonomous community, but there are four different islands, and each island deals with the waste differently. We have Ibiza, Formentera, and Menorca, which have landfill. But what we need is to use landfill as little as possible, move towards reduction, have more reuse, we need to ensure that uh, we have more reuse and to get citizens involved in, in this. When our landfill fills up, we'll have a problem uh, because there won't be any more room left. We have a lot of uh, areas that are protected natural areas. So in terms of space, we don't have further space for more landfill. In Mallorca, we have an incinerator with energy recovery, but it's, uh, well, there's four of them, and the idea is to uh, cut close two of the incineration plants. But we think that waste management shouldn't be thought of in a linear way. What happens is we have a lot of peak periods when the tourists arrive, so summer when we have peak uh, water consumption. So we have to think of this, uh, these peaks, otherwise we'll have uh, a lack of supply. In addition, we used to think uh, that uh, we could have incineration and that we could... Uh, then we would um, bury the ash. But if you have a very expensive infrastructure and if you don't increase rates, then, uh, well, I mean, uh, it doesn't make sense to import waste from elsewhere and burn it on the island of Mallorca. So we're ending that possibility of uh, importing uh, waste from elsewhere. We thought it was absolutely ludicrous to import waste from elsewhere and burn it on our island.
Okay, and just, I have seen you, sir, just bear, just bear with me a moment. Um, in the same, just to turn to you in this same issue, because when we talk about the closing of, of incineration plants also, and we, we're also looking at jobs, so you're saying we can't look at this linear, we are looking at a massive transition in general, not least in energy in the EU, and all of this is about jobs. So when we look at this, these trade-offs, when we look at how that works and we balance, just in a nutshell, do you have anything to add to this, uh, to this issue of how? How you balance all that? How do you not get locked into these infrastructures to make these changes? Yes, um, we, we, we need, uh, now at this moment in Portugal, we are doing our uh, waste uh, strategy, a uh, revision of our, our national waste strategy plan. Uh, and very important, when we try to, to think in, in des and design new uh, facilities, is important to have uh, this solution in mind. That means we need to, to reduce the amount of waste. We need to re uh, reduce about 50 a percent of food waste. We need to prevent, we need to, to put in place circular economy. So with all these, what, what, which kind of installation that we need? Mm -hmm. But the problem is in the meantime, we need to treat the amount, the daily waste that we receive. So uh, regarding LIPOR, we have a uh, waste to energy plant. We have capacity to treat uh, the amount of waste that a uh, greater Porto area produce, but if we start working in prevention that is most important and also to increase the recycling, we need to work with all the other municipalities, mm -hmm. not to have other infrastructure, but to use and optimize the infrastructure that we have already uh, in Portugal. Mm -hmm. The problem for Portugal is we have lots of asymmetries when you compare the big cities and the small village. Mm -hmm. And so we need to find decentralized solution, not big solutions. Mm -hmm. The problem is we think, oh, we need an infrastructure, mm -hmm. a big facility. No, we need to go closer to the cities. And much, be much more exactly. localized, which is because what we talked, the easier communities. easier to maintain, yeah. easier to produce, and we can have a direct uh, communication for the citizens. But it's also customised and localised exactly. and people take better ownership, but as we saw in the example the of Agnes. Okay, I'm going to ho hold it there a moment because I'm just conscious there was a gentleman at the back uh, got a mic. Can you obviously say where you're from and keep it nice and short? Is it for one specific person or is it a comment? Okay, thank you. It's for the representative of the Balearic Islands. I can do it in English or in Spanish. As, as in English, prefer. go in on. English. Just okay. save me the energy there. Okay, thank you. My name is Juan Revuelta. I represent uh, the Foundation Finnova. Um, coming back for the situation in Mallorca and with this big incinerator called TIRME, first congratulations for um, preventing the import of waste from Italy and from other places. Second, have you considered the possibility, in a legal way, that the municipality of Palma, Emaya, they can, rec they can recuperate the competence? Because at the moment, Tirme is a big okay, company representing for some multinationals that are earning a lot of money. It's not logical. It's true that today we have other technologies that can decrease the cost. And we have to say the cost of the waste management in, in Mallorca is one of the most expensive in all over Europe. Up after okay, I need Napoli. you to come to Napoli. a point. Sorry, only because... Thank you. The question, have you considered to work in the legal framework with the support of the European Union framework to try to recuperate that private, that, that, that competence of waste management for a public company as a Maya? Okay. Thank you. If you can kind of keep nice and concise, thank you. Uh, gracias, question. Thank you. It's a difficult question. I'll try to keep it brief. It's complicated to do that because we have a specific uh, way of dealing with this. So uh, the islands are going to decide whether they get back this competence and give it to the islands. So currently we have a law which makes it impossible to change the 
uh, management without paying a lot of money and it would cost a lot of money for the administrative authorities to change the system. What we're trying to do is to uh, produce less waste so that we can cut down some of the incineration plants. So go from uh, four to two. We also want to deal better with uh, organic waste and that can be dealt with at municipal level. So these are quite important measures which won't completely change the situation but at least they will mean that we burn less, we have to treat less uh, waste and we have more organic waste and that's really important. Thank you. We're going to jump to another topic now because um, I was going to bring you in anyway, Agnes, but we, we have a, a direct question for you here about the challenge. So, it's great, it's very replicable. Um, how can people access the content? How can they replicate that experiment elsewhere? Uh, we made an experiment uh, just for our uh, municipalities and now it's a, a Dutch experiment. And uh, it's, uh, all the information we have is, is in, in Dutch now, but I'm very happy to, to share the information and to help you with tips and other access to content, because uh, I think it's, it's great if we can make it not only Dutch, but European. Okay, so you can do that. You can personally translate and disseminate. Of course so I can. Obviously, well, it's obviously great. It's, it's captured the attention. Yeah, so, and but it's we're here to, to share our experiences. So. Okay. Yeah. Anything else from the floor? Yes, the gentleman here. There's a microphone and there's a gentleman here. We, those are the only last questions because I need to come. It's got to be nice and short. Yeah, Two very, sentences. Very short, very Thank short. you, sir. Who Thank are you? you? Uh, my name is Nun Lopes. I work for the Azers U office here in Brussels. And uh, my question is to Sebastian, please. Uh, so, which would be your advice? Our councils for the outermost regions or and or small islands, and uh, do you have uh, in Baleares, for instance, any specific projects regarding this, and uh, which were and or and or are your uh, main challenges okay. in in this moment? Thank you for Thank that you. nice large question. I hope Park. I will just park it just one moment, asking if there were any pro. Oh projects for the small islands, if there was any thoughts about the smaller islands, if there were specific challenges. That's the convenience about having somebody who can just do that on the panel. While we talk about that, there was another. Let's just hear what this gentleman has to say. Thank you. Just we'll park that. So just a moment. I'd like to just hear what, what this... Okay. Um, I'm Mark Ockhuizer, one of the... Uh a member of the expert panel for uh, Green Capital. Okay. And I see a lot of uh, really beautiful separation uh, uh, systems passed by a lot of uh, green municipalities. Uh, one of the biggest things I see as a lack in the knowledge uh, what is happening in all these green uh, cities is uh, what's happening with, uh, they, it looks like uh, they don't be aware about what's happening after they delivered it to a uh, recycling firm and so they think they are not responsible for that but they uh, stop by their res responsibility after they deliver it to a recycling firm mm -hmm. and what's happening after it and there's a lack of knowledge about it well I th okay well thank we're going to take that first actually just it and, and let's just extend that wider again we have a couple of minutes to talk not just there's a lack of knowledge after but just in general talking about the front end and the waste prevention what are those main barriers you know is it lack of knowledge is it lack of caring is it lack of resource is it what 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 do we see there who would like to come in on an answer yep yeah, yeah. yeah. So, nice and short. Yes. Thank um, you. Communication for us is important to communicate continuously, in an effective way, involve, commitment, but very, very important, be transparent. Mm -hmm. And sometimes when we are decision makers or we put in place some project, we are not so transparent as we, see, we must see. B. Okay. So very important communication, both. Both ways. Okay, Agnes. I would give uh, exactly the same answer. I would give the same answer to that. It's all okay. about communication and information. But it's all about caring as well, isn't it? Because there's this sense that you just leave it there, and then I don't really know what happens. So it's so. When you know what happens, 
um, you think uh, different about the waste. Yeah? And we saw it also in, uh, uh, in, in our experiment that um, people think different about food waste, about what's the leftovers after their meal. Um, uh, if, if they, uh, they know what they can do with it. Uh, just what, what Susanna mentioned. So you see it, you experience, you're a part of it. Just to yeah. go again, just to pick up on this issue of caring, because it is about communication, but you can, as we say in English, you can lead a horse to water and give that away. You can't make it drink. From the domains that you are working in, and we talk about social inclusion, and we talk about employment, and we talk about getting rid of these silos, silos and effectively caring, where do you, what would you like to add to that in terms of getting that engagement at local level. Well, it's kind of just tagging on to, to, to the end there in terms of being able to communicate directly to the citizen what is happening with their materials, if it's for recycling or their products, if it's for, for reuse. For example, there is a, a social enterprise in, in Northern Ireland, uh, Bryson uh, Recycling, which when it goes out on its trucks to, deli to collect uh, dry recyclables of packaging, etc. It has on the trucks exactly what is going to happen with the waste and where it's going to go and, what, and you know, for example, what kind of products are going to be made from it. And certainly the citizens very much buy into this because finally they, with a little bit of knowledge, and there's a number of surveys saying that if us as consumers, if we know more about what is happening with the waste, we are more likely to become part of that system and to, to really take back, for example, to really take part in source separation at home, etc. And it's the same in the field of textiles, for example, for, for reuse. If we, are, as organisations, are more transparent in what happens with the materials that we collect, that, for example, in, in our case, what the profits are used for and where the materials go, it brings a lot of buy-in and so citizens are more likely to, to, to want to work with us and donate and trust us and to work in a professional manner. I think this is very important. I think reuse, and if we talk about, for example, electronic waste, many people are maybe a little bit apprehensive about giving their mobile phones away or their laptops, etc., because of data. And, and you know, b being sure that you know, somebody is going to take that and ensure full data security, etc., mm -hmm. is something which is also this idea of of tracking traceability systems, standards, professionalization in the sector is also something which opens up doors and is important to allow the consumer to trust also partners working in the second-hand sector because it's yeah. important. Trust and transparency. Which is, interestingly, just to say, no, you can. Since the GDPR, I've been spammed more by emails saying, am I allowed to still email you than I was before by those emails, which I find fascinating when we talk about data. Yes, please, your last word. Yeah, so just to complement, um, in a circular economy, we have to also see what are the boundaries of the, of the circles. Mm -hmm. I mean, we have to understand, of course, it's very useful to communicate, but if most of the circularity happens at the city level, information is a lot easier because citizens actually see how this bottle is being reused and comes back, how the clothes are actually being repaired, etc. The shortening the supply chains, local production, etc. Of course, it cannot happen with everything, but that brings an element of actually of awareness for the citizen, because you see the local economy, you're shortening the supply chain. So actually making the circular economy go local is key. Of course, there's some things you cannot uh, bring at the local level. Mm -hmm. But of course, uh, if you talk about plastic, electronics, etc., things, as soon as it leaves the competency of the municipality and is shipped to I don't know where to be recycled yeah. into I don't know yeah. what, mm -hmm. Then don't expect the people, I mean, then to look documentaries. It's more difficult to inform in this situation. It's a lot easier to inform when actually you have the legal framework, you have the economic incentives for mm -hmm. circularity to take place at the local level. Mm -hmm. And at the moment, we don't have it. So I think that working in this direction, again, it's, it's key. Okay. I haven't forgotten you, but I'm going to park it because I'm going to come in bang on 11. What I'm going to ask is if you can please convene with this gentleman for those specifics afterwards, and anybody who wants to be a part of that conversation on the projects in the smaller islands, please. Uh, for the plastics, well, you are welcome to talk to these gentlemen. The question that came in on plastics, or even to the European Commission directly, we've got Malgazata in the room. Um, and if you want to find out more about home composting, so again, about consumer behaviour, we looked at households, but there's a whole thing going on that I didn't have time to get to in Porto. So extending everything that you spoke about in the restaurants to people, again, so it's experiential, which seems to be the theme of this, the caring, the transparency, the trust, getting that groundswell so that the policy makers are putting the right legislation in place to support that, then 
uh, please do talk to Susanna. So I thank you all very much. I'm going to let you have that conversation separately. Um, just let me say a couple of thank yous, of course, to you. For those of you who've tuned in online, for those of you who came here, thank you very much for being part of this and listening so attentively on behalf of uh, DG Environment. Thank you very much to our fabulous interpreters for their brain trickery. I don't know how they do it. Do not run off with the headsets, okay? Or you will have a security guard chase you through Brussels, all right? And I think you have a survey. For goodness sake, if you don't have time to do it now, at least do it later online. And that means that uh, the Commission can shape these events for you how you would like them, so have your say. On that note, I wish you a very fruitful day, but please, a big round of applause for our five genuinely fabulous speakers. Thank you. Thank you very much.